So most of you know that um, when I was here last Sunday, I was, um, I was sick. And um, I brought along my uh, faithful companion, Debbie, my wife, who um, is um, a gifted preacher herself and who was prepared. Uh, she had her own notes and was, she was sitting right there in the second or the third row, and she had them in front of her. And as I finished each paragraph, she checked that off. She said, well, I don't have to worry about that. Don't have to worry about that. And um, finally, I got down to the end, and she just folded it up and put it in her pocketbook. Um, and then I exited the sanctuary um, to prepare to go home. I spent um, the week until Thursday, from Sunday until Thursday, doing exactly what your doctors tell you to do when you have an, an infection. Get some rest. I drank some soup. I don't really care for soup. Um, but I drank some soup, and I had um, liquids, and took loads and loads and loads of medication. And Thursday, I finally get up. But I said, there's no way I can prepare what I had planned uh, to preach for this Sunday morning. And so I'm preaching instead a message entitled, It's All for the Good. It is all for the good. The Word of God is for your good. It is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man and woman of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped. Every now and then we need to go back to the basics. And today's message is a basic one to remind us that the scriptures are the foundation for all of our Christian beliefs. Some of us are familiar with the work of Robert Fulgham, especially when he describes some of the most important things he ever learned in life. He wrote it in a poem titled, All I Really Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. And he writes, Most of what I really need to know about how to live and what to do and how to be, I learned in kindergarten. Wisdom was not at the top of the graduate school mountain. But there in the sand pile at Sunday school, there are the things I learned. Share everything. Play fair. Don't hit people. Put things back where you found them. Clean up your own mess. Don't take things that aren't yours. Say you're sorry when you hurt somebody. Wash your hands before you eat. Flush. Warm cookies and cold milk are good for you. Live a balanced life. Learn some and think some. And draw and paint and sing and dance. And play and work every day some. Take a nap every afternoon. And when you go into the world, watch out for traffic. Hold hands and stick together. And be aware of wonder. Likewise, the scriptures are the foundation for everything that we need in life. It's all for the good. Because the scriptures provide us with the recorded message and the history of God's relationship with humanity. The scriptures are the inspired, authentic, and authoritative word of God. Of course, someone is thinking, but other religions also have their own sacred lit literature. Should we listen to those too? to which I partially agree. But our book, the Bible, has something that no other book can claim. First, the Bible is unique because God took, uh, took, on, took, took on the flesh and blood of humanity and lived among us. No other holy book, no other sacred book can make that claim. Our Bible is unique because God allowed his only son to die and be resurrected on the third day, as he had promised. 
Our book is the only book that although composed of 66 books written by 40 authors covering a period of approximately 1,600 years, that although there are 40 authors who wrote over a period of 1,600 years, there are no contradictions between any of the books of the Bible or any of their authors. The Bible not only contains many different stories and the history of many generations, yet it really has only one story to tell. Its central message is the redemption and salvation of humanity. Please note that in Paul's second letter to Timothy, Paul tells his young disciple and speaks in a way that seems to anticipate Paul's imminent death. He says, I am ready, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved is appearing. And so I raise the question about Paul's sense of his imminent death, because this letter was Paul's last letter, and he seems to anticipate the urgency of the time, as even in the ninth verse on this, of, of this passage, Paul appeals to Timothy and says, be diligent to come to me quickly. He celebrates the fact that he has fought the good fight. He rejoices at the knowledge that like a long-distance runner, he has finished the race and he has kept the faith and is awaiting the receipt of a crown of righteousness. But as he prepares to leave, he offers Timothy some fatherly advice that we should all claim for ourselves. Paul tells Timothy, you must continue, my brothers and sisters, you all, we all, must continue in the things that we have learned and been assured of. Have you continued in the things that you learned from, from childhood, from Sunday school, throughout your adulthood? Have you continued to learn from the things that you have been assured of? Have you, have you kept those things precious to yourselves? Last night... I was privileged to speak briefly with a family friend. And at some point, the conversation uh, went on matters on religion. And whenever, I don't know how it is in your family, but when religion comes up, it's a delicate matter. Because I need to make sure that I don't say things that I believe, truly believe, but that might turn out to be offensive to the person that I'm speaking them to. So I need to get the message across without whacking them upside the head. So this friend says, uh, how, she says, she opened the door and I asked her first of all, so do you belong to a church? Her answer, not anymore. She says, I used to, but I couldn't stand all the politics. And I commiserated with her about the unfortunate reality of politics within the church. Now, we're not talking about Democrats and Republicans and independents. We're talking about church politics. You know, church politics, the stuff that can get in the way of good fellowship, Church politics where one side of the building is believing that the other side of the building, the people on the other side, aren't really respecting the things that are contained with the people in the middle. The church politics. And so as I listened to her, I said to her, you know what? You can put the politics to the side, but what about your beliefs? What, what do you believe? Put the politics on the back burner and focus on your beliefs because those are the things that you learned when you were in Sunday school and as you grew into a young adult, you grew into a maturity. Those things are the most important things and those are the things that we need to rehearse and remember those things. 
And so most of her knowledge of the faith, while they were lasting, they were affected by the politics that goes on inside the church. And because of that, she was no longer attending worship. Well, verse 15 reminds Timothy that from childhood, he has known the Holy Scriptures. Some of us can't claim that because many were not raised in a Christian home. Some were marginally introduced to religion when, parents, uh, uh, when our parents sent us away for periods of the summer with our aunts and uncles and grandparents. And for some, those are the only times that we may have entered a church. Therefore, some may be unable to respond in the affirmative to Paul when he reminded Timothy that from childhood you have known the Scriptures. But how about you? How did you grow up in the church? And did you grow up in the church? Can you quote a passage from Scripture other than John 3.16? You know, for God so loved the world. Gotcha. <laughs> for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Uh, or, or maybe you know the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Or maybe the only passage you know is John 11.35, Jesus wept. And if I asked you right now, could you stand up? Could anybody in here, don't do it, I don't want to, I don't want to get anybody upset. If anybody in here could open up to the book of Zephaniah without turning on your phone to find the Bible app, could anybody in here, don't raise your hand, could anybody find the book of Zephaniah? John's looking for it. <laughs> but here's the point. Sometimes the most important things that we need in life, we learn when we were children, even as John Fulgham tried to suggest. The most important values, the most important beliefs, the matters that, of great faith for our lives, we learned them when we were young. And the question is, have you kept on to those things? Have you kept hold of them? You see, the scriptures are intended to serve in much the same way as goodness and mercy. Because those are the things that the 23rd Psalm says, that they will follow us all the days of our lives. The scriptures are meant to provide us with wisdom, counsel, comfort, hope, and strength, and most of all, assurance about eternal security. The scriptures were written for our instruction. They were written to teach us patience so that we might have hope. The scriptures are intended to serve as our roadmap to eternity. The scriptures demonstrate the faithfulness of the Lord such that Jeremiah couldn't help himself when he cried out, Great is thy faithfulness! The scriptures are to show us that God can keeps his promises. The scriptures help us not to be weary in well-doing, for in due time we shall reap if we do not lose heart. The scriptures were written to help us to hold on when we really want to just drop out and quit. The scriptures were written so that we might learn how to be patient in times of suffering. They're profitable. They're good for doctrine and instruction. You want to learn about God? Read his word. You want to learn about the weakness and sinfulness of humanity? Read the Bible. You want to learn about the manuscript for tomorrow's episode of Days of Our Lives? Read the Bible, and you will soon discover that every sin we learned, how, how, everything that we learned about how to sin, we learned directly from our parents and ancestors. And that's why we know that sin is a learned behavior. Every sin we have ever learned can be traced way back to Adam and Eve. The scriptures are, are profitable. They're good for everything we need, for reproof. When we think of we are getting away with something, there the scriptures are that reminds us, thou shalt not. The scriptures there are there to convict us of our wrongs. The scriptures are there to help us recognize our need to change before it's too late. The scriptures are profitable for correction. There's not one of us living today who, who wouldn't benefit from a little character correction or life improvement. And that's why the scriptures are everything we need for life. They're really good for everything. The scriptures are profitable for us to gain instruction in righteousness. Every now and then we all find ourselves in dangerous situations, not certain which way to go or what the right behavior is. The scriptures are ready to teach us how to gain righteousness. 
We don't need any modern day gurus, fortune tellers, or tarot cards to help us make life choices. The scripture speaks with the still small voice of the Lord. In fact, if you read 2 Peter 1, 2, and 3, it says, You will soon discover that grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So grace and peace are going to be multiplied, not added to you. They'll be multiplied to you through the knowledge, through our knowledge of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The word is all we need, for they provide us with the whole counsel of God. The word is all we need for life. Because man does not exist by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Father. The scriptures are all we need to build us up into the people of God who wants us, God wants us to become. The word is all we need to help us acquire an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. The word is all we need. For in it, God has given us everything we need that pertains to life and godliness. The world... Is the word is all we need because as Paul wrote they are capable of making us complete full that, 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 that everything that we ever really needed in life to make it through this life God says I can give that through you through my word and so I celebrate with you the word that the Lord has given to us and I pray that he touches each and every one of us as we try to gain more knowledge and more understanding about the word of God. For it is capable of making us whole and complete. Amen? Amen. Amen. Eternal Lord our God, we um, thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to share the gospel news that uh, Jesus Christ has given us his word that if we believe in him, he would give us eternal life. And so, Lord, we thank you for that eternal life. 